Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we'll be discussing the bones and joints that form the knee joint, which is more appropriately referred to as the tibiofemoral joint. Now, as we explore the joint, let's first make note of the fact that it is the largest diarthroidal or freely movable joint within the body. And based on the name, we can note that it is made up of the tibia and the femur. What we don't include as part of the joint is the fibula, and this is because it doesn't articulate with the knee joint. However, its presence provides benefits to both the knee and ankle joint in terms of functionality. And if we needed to classify this joint, we could refer to it as a trochoganglimus joint. And what we have here is the combination of two terms, trochoidal and ganglimus. And it's with a trochoidal joint that we have some rotation that takes place. And it's through a ganglimus joint that we have hinge joint movements such as flexion and extension that occur. And because the knee is responsible for bearing a great deal of the body's weight, it needs a great deal of stability. And part of its stability is achieved from its surrounding musculature, which includes the knee joint flexors, which are the hamstring muscles, and the knee joint extensors, which are the quadriceps muscles. And not only this, there are strong ligamentous structures that provide stability to the knee joint as well. These include the anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, medial collateral ligament, and the lateral collateral ligament. And we'll explore these further in just a moment. Continuing with our overview of the tibiofemoral joint, there is another joint that we need to make note of as well, which we refer to as the patellofemoral joint. This is, based on the name, an articulation between the patella and the femoral groove of the femur. And it's here at this joint that we can classify it as an arthroidal joint, meaning that gliding motions take place here. So specifically, the patella glides superiorly and inferiorly within the femoral groove during knee joint motion. As we continue investigating the knee joint, we'll notice that the femur projects downward at a slanted angle to meet with the tibia. And it's because of this that the medial condyle of the femur is slightly larger than the lateral condyle. The way we refer to this anatomical alignment is by the name Q-angle, which stands for the quadriceps angle. And it represents, as we described earlier, the amount of lateral deviation of the femur from the tibia. And perhaps an alternative definition makes even more sense. We could also say that it is the angle formed by the quadriceps muscle group and the patellar tendon. Now, regardless of the description or definition we use, the Q angle is formed by two lines. The first line is from the anterior superior iliac spine of the hip, or what we can abbreviate as the ASIS, to the center of the patella, and we'll showcase this line on the image here. Our second line is from the center of the patella to the tibial tuberosity, and we'll allow this line to extend upwards so that we can better visualize the angle being formed. Now, right in between the lines we've created, we have our Q angle. And to make our understanding of this angle a little more useful, it's helpful to know that we can measure this angle. And by doing so, we find that the typical range for males is between 10 and 15 degrees, whereas for females, the typical range is between 15 and 20 degrees. Now, what makes this even more helpful is to note that individuals who have higher Q angles higher than 15 degrees for males and 20 degrees for females are more predisposed to having knee joint complications, specifically complications within the patellofemoral joint and injuries to the ligamentous structures of the knee. So now that we have a solid overview of the knee joint, let's take a few moments and identify its anatomical components along with the fibula. First, we have the shaft of the femur. And next, we have the lateral condyle of the femur. And just lateral to it, there is a smaller projection, which we refer to as the lateral epicondyle. Next, we have the patellar surface of the femur, which is the space in between the femoral condyles and the place in which the patella glides superiorly and inferiorly. 
Just below this, we have the proximal tibial fibular joint, which of course joins the tibia and fibula together proximally. Medially, we have a small projection here, which is the medial epicondyle. And it's this medial epicondyle, which is a small part of the larger structure known as the medial condyle. And just distal to this is the medial tibial condyle, which is of course a smaller component of the larger tibia, or what is commonly referred to as the shin bone. Next, we have the superior portion of the patella, which is oftentimes referred to as its base. And inferior to the base is the apex of the patella. Next, we have the lateral tibial condyle. And in between and slightly inferior to the tibial condyles is the tibial tuberosity. And last but certainly not least, to complete our labeling of the anterior view of the knee is the fibula. Now let's take a look at the posterior aspect of the knee. And on this view, we'll be labeling some of the same structures we looked at on the anterior aspect. However, viewing and labeling them this way gives us a better appreciation of the knee's structure. First, we have the medial and lateral femoral condyles. And in between these, on the posterior aspect, we have what's called the intercondylar fossa. And just inferior to this, we have the medial and lateral tibial condyles. Now that we've covered the general bony anatomy of the knee joint, let's take a look at some of the most prominent ligamentous structures. First, we have the anterior cruciate ligament, or the ACL, and just behind this is the PCL, or the posterior cruciate ligament. And what's helpful to note here is that the term cruciate means to cross, and we can see that indeed, these two ligaments cross over one another if we look at them from an anterior view. And it would be the same if we were to view this from a side view. However, if we were to take a look at these ligaments from a superior perspective, they would appear to be parallel to one another. Next, we have the lateral collateral ligament, which is sometimes referred to as the fibular collateral ligament, and the medial collateral ligament, which is sometimes referred to as the tibial collateral ligament. And sitting atop of the tibia is the menisci, the lateral meniscus, and then the medial meniscus. Now that we're familiar with the location of the knee's primary ligaments, we can now take a moment to identify the attachment points of these ligaments and introduce the motions these ligaments prevent. First, we have the anterior cruciate ligament, which begins on the anterior aspect of the tibial plateau, and it completes its attachment to the posterior medial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, and its role is to prevent anterior or forward displacement of the tibia on the femur and to also protect against hyperextension of the knee. Next is the posterior cruciate ligament, which begins on the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau, and it completes its attachment at the anterolateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. And its job is to protect against posterior displacement of the tibia on the femur and to protect against hyperflexion. The lateral collateral ligament's proximal attachment is on the lateral epicondyle of the femur, and it completes its attachment at the head of the fibula. Its responsibility is to protect against various forces, which are forces applied to the medial aspect of the knee, which may injure this ligament. And last but certainly not least is the medial collateral ligament, which attaches from the medial epicondyle of the femur to the medial aspect of the tibia. And its primary responsibility is to protect against valgus forces, which are lateral forces applied to the knee joint that may injure this ligament. Now let's take a closer look at the menisci and the cruciate ligaments. First, we have the medial meniscus followed by the lateral meniscus. And we can denote the difference between these first because the medial meniscus is a larger open C-shaped structure, whereas the lateral meniscus is a more closed shape C-structure. 
In addition, if we note the presence of the fibula here, it helps to indicate which side is the lateral aspect. Now that we've labeled the lateral and medial meniscus, it also becomes easier for us to identify the medial and lateral tibial plateau. And it's here that we also find the articular cartilage of the knee. And we are also able to identify the location of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, getting a better idea of their attachment sites. Previously, we had an opportunity to identify the two main landmarks of the patella, and here we'll look at the patella from both an anterior and posterior view. Anteriorly, we have the superior border, which is also referred to as the base of the patella. And next, we have the inferior border of the patella, also referred to as the apex. And on the undersurface of the patella, we have the articular facets where the patella glides within the femoral groove either superiorly and inferiorly as it occurs with movement of the knee joint. Now on this image, we are examining the knee from a sagittal view. And here again, we're going to see some of the same structures we've looked at a few times. And for that reason, labeling of the femur, tibia, and patella are currently presented. In addition to these structures, we have the posterior cruciate ligament and the anterior cruciate ligament. We also have the patella tendon, which is what allows the muscles of the quadriceps to attach to the patella and to then attach to the tibial tuberosity as the patellar ligament. Next, we'll take a moment to identify some of the bursa of the knee joint. Now, it's important to know that bursa are small sacs of synovial fluid that are positioned between ligament, bones, and tendons to reduce the amount of friction that takes place during movement. So first, we have the suprapatellar bursa, followed by the prepatellar bursa. And you'll notice that the names of the bursa are conveniently named based on their location. For example, the prefix supra means above. And so suprapatellar indicates that the bursa is above the patella, and the prefix pre indicates that this bursa is in front of the patella. Next, we have the synovial cavity, and the synovial cavity is the space between the articulating surfaces of the femur and the tibia, and it's within this cavity that we have a collection of synovial fluid to lubricate the joint. The yellow substance that we see here is the infrapatellar fat pad, and you may be surprised to know that its functions are extensive. And of these functions, a primary one is to provide blood supply to the inferior pole of the patella and to the patellar ligament. And last but not least, we have the infrapatellar bursa. Let's take a moment now to look holistically at the movements of the knee. First, as we indicated earlier, the tibiofemoral joint can be referred to as a trochoganglimus joint. And while this still remains true, the joint is primarily a ganglimus joint, functioning like a hinge and providing us with the opportunity to perform flexion and extension. And specifically, those movements, flexion and extension, are produced in the sagittal plane. Now, for flexion, the range of motion is between 0 and 150 degrees, whereas full extension is typically recorded as 0 degrees. Now, as it pertains to the knee joint, we don't want to disregard the term trochoidal that we mentioned a moment ago. In this regard, trochoidal simply refers to rotation. And in this regard, we can say that the knee joint allows us to perform both internal and external rotation. But it's important to notice the asterisks on these movements, because the internal and external rotation that is mentioned here isn't the same as what is seen in other joints. This rotation occurs as a result of either flexion or extension. And lastly, we also have the patella femoral joint to consider, which we can refer to as an arthroidal joint. And the movements here are gliding motions that either occur superiorly or inferiorly with the knee's primary movements. Let's take a look at what's called the screw home mechanism of the knee. 
What this mechanism represents is that in order for the knee to move from a flexed position to a fully extended position, the knee must screw home, or in other words, rotate, so that the femur and tibia are properly aligned. So on the left side of the screen, let's imagine that we're considering someone seated with their knee flexed to 90 degrees. And while remaining in this seated position, they intend to fully extend their knee as shown on the right side of the screen. And based on the orthokinematic rule that would apply here, we would have the concave surface moving on the convex surface. And in this manner, the roll will occur in the direction of the action, and the slide will occur in the same direction. So here, both the roll and slide are occurring in a forward direction. And to achieve alignment of the tibial and femoral condyles, the tibia will perform approximately 10 degrees of external rotation to achieve a fully extended position. We can refer to this rotation as the spin arthrokinematic movement. Now, if we were to have this individual return their leg to a flexed position from a fully extended position, the same arthrokinematic rule would apply. We would have the concave surface moving on the convex surface. Now, in order for this to occur, the knee would have to unlock itself from its extended position. And to do this, the tibia would have to internally rotate. And this internal rotation is analogous to our spin arthrokinematic movement. And like before, the roll and slide arthrokinematic movements will occur in the same direction as the action. In this example, the roll and the slide are going to occur in a posterior direction. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. And if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below. And I'll look forward to connecting with you again in the next video.